Our guest today made history. But she is the smartest of all the public servants. She shakes, shakes everyone's hand, and then she comes to the speaker's table. So before I introduce her, give her a round of applause for being super smart. Our guest today made history by becoming the first woman to serve as Attorney General in the state of Illinois. She is a community leader, lawyer, and educator. After receiving her bachelor's degree from Georgetown University, our guest today moved to Africa at the height of the apartheid struggle, serving as a volunteer school, to school teacher to young Zulu women helping them overcome racism, violence, and oppression through education. Prior to, be elect, prior to being elected Attorney General, she served in the Illinois Senate, Senate. Our guest today earned her law degree from Loyola University. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome back to the City Club of Chicago the Attorney General of the State of Illinois, Lisa Madigan. Lisa? Well, I just said to Jay, so, so what's our timing here? And he says to me, well, you're the attorney general. You're the boss. I thought, well, yeah, I was the boss who was told that we would start at 1245, so I could, in fact, shake everybody's hand. So for those of you whose tables I just waved at, I apologize. It is my, uh, my goal to at least say hello to everybody who was kind enough to take the time and to make the effort to be with us today. And it's a pretty packed room. Uh, some people commented that it looked like my wedding. In fact, I didn't have this many people at my wedding, <laughs> intentionally. Um, but it is a thrill. It's always exciting to be at the City Club because it's always enjoyable to have a conversation with people who are engaged and concerned about public policy. So Jay, I very much thank you for inviting me back today to be with everybody. Now, I know we have some new faces in the crowd. Um, so. Many of you have already heard me do the overview of the Office of the Attorney General. Uh, General Burris could probably do an even better job of telling you what it is the Office of the Attorney General does. But today, what I would like to do is to focus on two issues. And I want to focus on two issues. One's a civil issue, one's a criminal issue, because I think that these two issues will give you a very good sense of how it is the office operates how it is we pick what issues we are going to be working on. But let me very briefly, because there were more new people than I anticipated bumping into today, uh, let me give you very briefly the overview. And here's what it is. Um, I run the state's largest public interest law firm. We have, as of today, 345 attorneys in that office and almost as many staff people who are engaged every single day on working on issues to help the people of the state of Illinois. And we are really fortunate, I think, to have that chance to be able to be an advocate for the people of the state of Illinois. And as you can imagine, today I could talk about uh, an incredible array of timely and interesting issues. Um, we could talk about uh, that one of the headlines in the Tribune today dealing with our ongoing investigation into the student loan industry. We certainly will continue to have conversations in the state and around the country about school safety in the aftermath of the massacre at Virginia Tech. We could be talking about uh, the environmental advocacy that our office does, and in particular about the two U.S. Supreme Court cases that were recently decided, uh, one regarding the Clean Air Act, another involving global warming, and, uh, and there's a lot to be said in terms of what those mean uh, for Illinois and for the rest of the country. We also could be talking about the potential impact of last week's U.S. Supreme Court decision on abortion here in the state of Illinois. And certainly, we could talk about the controversy surrounding electric rate increases. And I noticed this year that my friends from ComEd haven't joined us. <laughs> but a one, not a table, but one person. I apologize. Anyway, we have limited time. So as I said, today, what I would like to do is to focus on just two of our priorities, because they are exceptionally important issues that have already impacted 
um, hundreds of Illinois families and communities, and they have the potential to affect many hundreds more. So let's, um, let me talk briefly about really the approach that we take when it comes to determining what issues we are going to work on. Because I think most of you have recognized that over the last four years, we've done more than simply bring lawsuits uh, when it comes to enforcing the laws or when it comes to dealing with policy issues. We really do approach issues from a multiple, multiple different angles, and we do program and policy development. We do legislative advocacy, and of course, we litigate. Um, you know, it is one of, uh, one of our best tools that we've got, but it's one that we reserve until we ultimately need to use it. We also have been very effective, uh, and I really credit my staff, of whom there's an entire table of them here. Um, I credit my staff with bringing stakeholders to the table, bringing them into our discussions. And so we work every day with legislators, with law enforcement. Uh, we work with businesses. We work with nonprofits. We work with government agencies. We work with advocates. Um, and we focus on solving problems that have a broad impact on the people of the state of Illinois, and ones that we believe that the resource of the Attorney General's office can truly make a crucial difference. I look at it in very simple terms. We focus on issues that are in need of real solutions, and we can bring those to the table. I think the two issues that I want to discuss today are going to be perfect examples uh, of what I've been talking about. One is mortgage foreclosure and really the crisis that we're seeing in the housing market because of it. Uh, two, I want to talk about the increasing use of the internet to perpetrate crimes against children. Let's start with the mortgage arena, and in particular, um, foreclosure issues. Every single day, almost, it's not every day, but some days it's more than once, we actually hear from families that are on the verge of losing their homes, and also the hard-earned equity that they've built up in those homes. When we dig deeper, when we really get into these cases, we very quickly learn that these are almost never circumstances where a family has simply gotten into a mortgage that was too large for them, that they never could have afforded in the first place. Frequently, we find out that mortgage brokers or mortgage lenders have lured a family into a refinancing deal that is extraordinarily complex and onerous. It's really oftentimes a loan that very few families would ever be able to meet, would ever be able to afford. And if we look at the numbers, it is very clear that we are experiencing a crisis here in Illinois. So according to a study by the Woodstock Institute, in 2006, foreclosures in the state of Illinois jumped 55%. There were a total of 72,455 foreclosure filings, and it's expected to rise even higher in the year 2007. In fact, the numbers that came out of the Circuit Court of Cook County for the first two months of this year indicate that foreclosure filings rose by more than 50% and that they are projected to hit a record high of 33,000 by the end of the year. Our office is also registering this increase. So last year in 2006, we had more than 700 mortgage-related complaints come into the office. That's a doubling of the number of mortgage-related complaints that we got in the year 2005. All of this leads us to ask the question of why are foreclosures increasing? The answer in some ways is a simple one. It is almost entirely because of subprime lending. And so let's start by answering the question for those of you who hopefully don't know the answer to it. What is a subprime loan? These loans were certainly created with very worthy goals. The concept initially was to make home ownership possible to people with poor credit histories. But as this market really took off, as it's become a volume-driven industry, they relaxed their standards, and the features of these loans changed substantially uh, to really produce higher profits for the brokers and the lenders, but at horrible, if not financially devastating, cost to the borrowers. And so as you can imagine, we now have a situation where there's certainly an increased rate, an increased likelihood of failure. And subprime loans have some certain characteristics that most of you hopefully are not familiar with in your own mortgages. So most of us who are here, and if you have a mortgage, you probably have a 30-year 30 30 fixed-rate mortgage. 80% of 
mortgages that are in the subprime area are adjustable rate mortgages. We refer to them as, as 228s or 327s. What that means is for two years, for three years, there's going to be a low introductory rate. But after that point, uh, the rate is going to reset. And it's going to be a rate that is about, this is going to be an, an approximation here, because usually they, I think they use LIBOR. But let's say it's prime plus an index amount. So prime plus, say, 7, 6, 8 percent. Uh, so suddenly someone has gone from having a mortgage that they could afford on a monthly basis to one that, that more than doubles in terms of their monthly payment. People often don't realize that they've even entered into an adjustable rate mortgage where the rate is only going up. In addition, once they do realize this, once it has become a financial burden, there are extraordinary prepayment penalties, which financially prohibit the person in this horrible mortgage from getting out of the mortgage. So they're trapped in this very burdensome mortgage. In addition, we have found numerous circumstances where there are no documents involved, no documents involved in determining whether or not the person, the borrower, would even be able to repay the mortgage at the higher rate that it uh, ultimately will reset at. So we have seen too many people get into these mortgages where it is, you know, a high interest rate, high fees, very expensive for the borrowers, very lucrative for the brokers and for the lenders. And so then you have to say to yourself, well, why is it that borrowers are entering into these loans? Um, one of the reasons is that brokers steer people to these mortgages, again, with the promise that this is going to be a mortgage with a lower monthly payment. And that's true for the first few years. But at the end of the day, and really at the end of two to three years, which is not a very long day for folks, that completely changes and it becomes impossible for them to make their payments. Two, the other reason that this occurs, loan securitization. And so there has been a huge growth in the subprime lending market in large part because there has been this trend to securitize loans in large bundles and sell them on Wall Street. So for those of you who have followed this issue in the press, um, you've seen that uh, the argument that the growth of subprime lending um, was good, even with the current increase that we are seeing in foreclosure rates. Well, to me, that brings up the responsibility to completely debunk the biggest myth about subprime lending, and that's this. Subprime lenders, subprime mortgage brokers will take credit and will tell you that because of subprime loans, there has been an enormous increase in the number of people who have been, who have been able to become homeowners. So people, as I said, with previously bad credit, bad credit history, who have been able to now own a home, really have the American dream. But the lenders and the brokers argument is completely untrue. So there is now a report that came out of the Center for Responsible Lending that has shown that subprime loans have not resulted in a net gain in home ownership. In fact, the explosion of the subprime industry has resulted in a net loss, a net loss in home ownership. And let me tell you why this is. Because from 1998 to 2006, only 9%, 9% of subprime loans went to first-time home purchasers. But over that same period of time, 15% of subprime loans ended with borrowers losing their homes to foreclosure. So imagine that. So subprime lending has resulted in a net loss across our country in home ownership. Are you enjoying this so far? <laughs> To me, this is fascinating, and, and, it's, and it's important. <laughs> the rates for foreclosure and subprime loans that were taken in 2005 and 2006 is even higher. It's 20%. It's one in five. So one in five people who get into these loans are going to lose their homes. And according to a 2004 HUD report, and this really shouldn't be a surprise, homeowners who give up home ownership for any reason take at least, at least a decade to get back. And it's longer for minority populations. So I'm going to repeat these statistics again until you're excited. Only 9% of subprime loans involve the purchase of a first home. The majority of subprime loans are refis. 
That means that we have cash-strapped homeowners who have been convinced to tap into the equity of their home to pay off other debts, to pay off credit card debts. Or even worse, they have been persuaded by unscrupulous lenders and brokers to refinance their mortgages with this promise that they're going to be these great financial benefits to them, and ultimately they lose their homes. So this is really a, a disaster, and it is in particular a disaster for African Americans and for Latinos. Um, the Woodstock Institute estimates that African American borrowers are 3.8 times more likely to receive a subprime loan than a white borrower, and Latino borrowers are 3.6 times more likely to do so. So that really brings us to, uh, to why I'm standing here talking about this, and that is what is the solution to this problem? Um, some people have argued that the market will correct it. Others say that federal regulators need to step in. But we have been examining this issue for many years. We've dealt with it in terms of what I refer to as impact litigation. We've gone after some of the largest subprime lenders in the market, uh, household finance. AmeriQuest is the most recent company that we settled with. And we have realized that even though we can change a little bit the practices of, um, of some of the larger lenders, ultimately we need to take a multifaceted approach to this. And unfortunately, many of the problems that we have seen in this industry are caused quite simply by unscrupulous lenders and unscrupulous borrowers, or brokers, I mean. So solving this problem is going to require us to address those issues. And here's one of the things that we're doing that I am most proud of. Um, we are going to, and we already have, we're working with Representative Dan Burke. We've introduced a package of legislation. And I'm going to go through with you what it does, because you will think to yourselves when you hear this, doesn't this already happen? But believe it or not, it does not. So here are some of the protections that we want to provide to borrowers on a statewide basis. Protections at the time of origination. We want to require require that lenders and brokers actually verify the borrower's ability to repay the loan. Does that sound reasonable to you all? Great, well, tell your legislators. Two. <laughs> This legislation is going to create a duty for mortgage brokers to obtain for their borrowers the best deal that the broker can find for them, essentially creating a fiduciary duty. Sound like a good idea? Good. You would hope that that's what your broker was doing, but that's not often happening, unfortunately. Three, we want to prohibit prepayment penalties. If you get into a lousy mortgage, you should be able to get out of your lousy mortgage without incurring additional financial burdens that you couldn't meet in the first place. Three or four, I should say, um, we're outlawing what we simply refer to as bait and switch. So if the material terms of the mortgage change, you need to be notified 24 hours before the closing. Believe it or not, people are being told you're getting a fixed rate mortgage. They sign the paperwork only to learn it's an adjustable rate mortgage. If you change the terms, you have to tell the person. Again, you'd imagine this is happening. It is not. The second part of this is to require protections at the time of foreclosure. So when somebody goes into foreclosure, we want the lenders to give the borrowers who are in default and are possibly facing foreclosure a notice of their rights, 30 days to cure, as well as information on where they can find legal and financial assistance. And this really brings us to the next thing that we're doing, and that is to make sure that we put in place we're going to do two statewide foreclosure prevention summits. One is going to address making sure that there are the legal resources out there for individuals when they face foreclosure. We don't want people dealing with yet another unscrupulous mortgage lender when they try to find their way out of this problem. We want to make sure they are well represented. And there are a lot of good people here from the Illinois Equal Justice Foundation who are working with us to make sure that around the state those legal aid resources are available. We've also been working with LAF. We've been working with CVLS here in the Chicago area to make that happen. In addition, we are also making sure, and we're going to do a summit around this, that there are financial resources available. Because obviously, one of the most difficult situations, if these people can't make their mortgage payments, the question is, how are we going to find a way to refinance? And so already, there have been a number of lenders who are offering up pools of money to do this. We want to make sure that people are aware that those resources are out there and make sure to put them together with the borrowers who are in need. 
And so that is some of what we are doing. Uh, there is more that we have been doing, educational summits uh, around the state that have been ongoing for the past two years. We also have an entire guide that if any of you, God forbid, are in this situation or know somebody who is in this situation, get on our website, IllinoisAttorneyGeneral.gov, and you can find this information about what to do before you enter into a mortgage, as well as what to do once you're in one and you're possibly facing default and foreclosure. So we will continue to work on this. Um, it is a very important issue. Be thankful if you're in your fixed rate mortgage and you don't have some adjustable rate mortgage that you cannot contend with. Internet safety. Maybe you'll find this more interesting. <laughs> you're, you're a tough crowd today. I think you ate too much of that good food. Um, internet safety has been a priority for our office for a number of years. Uh, it is an increasing problem. Uh, obviously, as the technology quickly evolves, uh, we unfortunately are seeing a rise in the internet being used as a way to perpetrate crimes against children. And as you can imagine, predators who seek out children over the internet are particularly difficult for law enforcement to track down and arrest, uh, in large part just because of the internet's global reach and because, as I said, there are constantly changing technologies, so they're constantly changing tactics, and we have to adapt to the new technology and those new tactics that the predators out there have, uh, have adopted. So here's another reason, and the really one of the main reasons these crimes are difficult contend with. Oftentimes, they're difficult to prevent and they're difficult to contend with because many parents, they're just starting to realize the dangers of the internet for their kids, and that's not surprising. So our children use the internet in ways that we couldn't have even imagined 10 years ago when we first started even hearing about or even using the internet. So let me step back and start by talking about how children use the internet. So one, I think all of us are, are delighted and impressed and probably just astounded at the resource that the internet provides for our kids in terms of learning. Uh, and so, you know, unlike when we were growing up, kids these days literally have a world of information available to them at their fingertips. And it's at any time of day, almost any place. So they're not constrained by, you know, oh, left my book at school, or, you know, what are the hours of the library, or I don't have my library card. They have the internet, and it has proven to be a wonderful tool in that regard. But I assume that many of you in this room, in fact, I, I'm going to venture to guess all of you in this room, you're like me. We did not grow up at a time where there were computers in our schools, or if there were computers, you know, we were doing things like programming in BASIC. I think the most advanced thing that was going on at my school in high school was I think people were programming in COBALT or something, whatever that used to be. And, well, there you go. I'm not even pronouncing it correctly. <clears throat> the Attorney General was not a math major. No surprise, I hope, to anybody. Um, you know, you didn't have a computer at home. Most of you, and I'm, I fall into this category, probably the first time you got onto the internet was at work. And let's do, let's do a little audience participation to liven you up a little. I want, you to, I want you to raise your hands. Who in this room uses the internet for email? Raise your hand. Okay, I'm not going to say who's not raising their hand. Keep your hands up. Who uses the internet, and you can move them up and down if you need to, who uses the internet uh, to, to look at the newspapers, to look at the news? The media folks will be curious to see this response. Who does research on the internet? Oh, good, still people. Who goes shopping on the internet? Who gets their airplane tickets on the internet? Bill Hood wants to know. Um, who sends pictures of their kids to, uh, to other relatives, to grandparents? The women in the room. Who, uh, who downloads music or TV shows? I know, I know some people at my table do. Legally, legally. <laughs> no Napster. Who, uh, who's playing games on the internet? The same person who knows how to pronounce cobalt correctly. Um, who, who wants to admit they, they date online? Okay. Two people. You guys get together. Um, any, of you <laughs> any of you spend any time in chat rooms on the internet? Chat rooms. Okay, only one. Anybody in this room have a, have a MySpace page, have a profile on MySpace? 
Don't count your candidates. And really? Okay. I know him. Anybody? Uh, anybody have a profile in any other social networking site? Interesting. Aha, we'll get to that point in a moment. Thank you, Phil. Phil Hale from Loyola, <laughs> checking out his students. Okay, so a lot of you, you know, you use the internet the way I do. You are getting your email, you're reading the news, you are, uh, you know, getting your airplane tickets, you're doing a little bit of shopping, you're doing a lot of research. Few of you, however, are doing the socializing on the internet that kids are doing these days. And this is where the danger comes in, because too often parents, and certainly, certainly teenagers, remember when you were a teenager? You really didn't think anything was ever gonna happen to you. And so they fail to appreciate the risks that come with this new way of meeting people. I wanna go through with you some statistics about what kids are doing online and what they encounter, because I find these statistics eye-opening. Um, and they certainly, I think, go a long way toward explaining why internet safety is such an important issue. There's a not-for-profit foundation called iSafe, and they, uh, they are dedicated to protecting children online, but they also do periodic surveys of youth internet users from the ages of 10 to 17. And their most recent report that I've looked at came out in November. And among the students that were surveyed here is what they said. 50% of high school students talk in chat rooms or use instant messaging with internet strangers, so people they've never, ever met in person, people they don't really know. 49% of high school students reported that they have posted personal information online. And by personal information, here's what I mean. Their name, their age, the school they attend, their home address, their phone number. 20% of students in middle school, as well as high school, admit, this is terrifying, admit that they have met face to face with someone they first met on the internet. Unclear as to whether or not they told their parents, unclear as to whether or not they went with a parent, let's assume they did not. 34% reported seeing sexual material online that they did not want to see. The rest wanted to see it, I presume. 13% <laughs> reported being solicited for sex online. 13% and those are the ones that reported it. Almost 40% of high school students admit to sometimes hiding their online activities from their parents. Again, 40% are willing to admit this. There's probably a larger percent that didn't admit it. Finally, 65% of high school students admit to unsafe, inappropriate, or illegal activities online. So, as I said, eye-opening numbers that I also find shocking as well as quite troubling. And they really show us just how much times have changed. So, you all probably remember, as I do, when we went to school, there was that day every year where Officer Friendly showed up. And Officer Friendly talked to us about Stranger Danger. And Stranger Danger was this creepy guy who was going to show up in the park, probably. And maybe he'd flash us. Maybe he'd try to give us candy, lure us into a car. Well. These days, the playground for Stranger Danger is the internet. And Stranger Danger is probably already in homes, just at the other end of your child's computer. So that means that all of us as adults, all of us as parents have a responsibility to learn about what's going on on the internet and to talk with children about what's happening on the internet so as to better protect them. Now, let me give you a bigger picture of the work that we do. I'm not just here to scare you about the internet and, uh, and go home and throw the computer out if you have kids still at home. In 2004, we created the Illinois Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force with a grant from the United States Department of Justice. And what this task force does is to identify, arrest, and convict sex offenders who prey on children using computer technology. But what we also do is that we train parents in particular to understand the hazards of the internet to help us protect children. And so today we have over 60 law enforcement agencies that are part of this task force. And in the past year, I'm particularly proud that we have been able to recover uh, two missing children, two children from Illinois who were lured out of state by sex offenders that they met on the internet. One ended up in Missouri, the other ended up in Texas. So we were able to retrieve two live children 
who were lured away from their homes. In addition, the task force has arrested over 66 sexual predators last year. We conducted 48 trainings for police and other law enforcement. Moreover, and, and more importantly, I think to this group, we conducted 103 training sessions for parents as well as students and were able to reach out to almost 25,000 people that way. But let me give you two quick, two typical examples of what we see happening online, uh, because that way you'll understand not just how these predators operate, but how the task force operates. OK, as we've talked about, MySpace tends to be a very popular social networking site. And it is really one of the most popular sites with kids these days. And it's also, as you can imagine, therefore well-traveled by these sexual predators. And so here's what, for those of you who have never seen one of these sites, here's what it is. It's basically um, a site where anybody can put up information about themselves. You can put up a picture. You can put, you know, answer a whole bunch of questions. You know, do you like ketchup or mustard? Do you like vanilla ice cream or chocolate ice cream? Um, but it also includes you know, the opportunity for you to do a narrative. It also includes the opportunity for you to put up way too much personal information. And that's what we find happens. And so then what the predators do is they set up their own site on MySpace. Now, they probably don't put their picture up. They probably use some other picture, or they use no picture at all. But they set up the site. And then what they can do is they can look through. They can search everybody else's profile. And so in a typical situation, Here's a real life situation that occurred in one of the suburbs here in Chicago, out in Naperville. The, this guy would search these My, MySpace profiles and he would identify high school girls in the Naperville area. And then what he would do is he would send out a message, something, you know, kind of innocuous, you know, hey, saw your picture, think you're cute, you know, want to chat. Well, ultimately, while not everybody responds, there are certain kids who do respond. And then what ends up happening is, you know, in, in particular in this instance, one of the girls that he targeted ended up, you know, starting to talk back and forth with him. She finally realized there was something wrong. She felt uncomfortable. And so she had the wherewithal, probably because we've done a decent amount of training in the Naperville area, she had the wherewithal to contact local police. Local police then worked with the task force, took over the screen name of this young girl, this high school girl, and were able to eventually set up to meet him. Of course, when, uh, when the predator arrived, we were there to arrest him. But what we learned through our investigation was this wasn't the only girl he had targeted. And this wasn't the only time he had arranged to meet up with a girl. This wasn't the only time he had had hopes to have sex with an underage girl. In fact, he had done it many times before. And so he has been charged and he has been indicted. Uh, but it's a very typical situation we find. And the response that kids often have when we go back and do these investigations is, I, I didn't know. He seemed you know, like a normal you know, 14, 15, 16-year-old kid. Um, and that really brings me to the, to the second um, example, which is very typical. And it really shows how anonymous you can be on the internet. The second example is one where, you know, instead of saying, you know, hey, I'm just looking to meet up with you, you say, hey, I'm a modeling agent. And you eventually convince the girl or the boy to take inappropriate pictures. And once those pictures are out there, you really can't ever get them back. Uh, in this circumstance, uh, we had a situation where a young woman had been convinced to take inappropriate pictures of herself. Turns out her father found those pictures. He contacted local police who worked with our task force. Again, we assumed the screen name of the girl uh, and eventually discovered that this individual was in Utah. And so we were able to work with local authorities in Utah to have him arrested. He's now facing a life sentence in prison. But it's happening all of the time. And what I would like to make clear to those of you who are parents or those of you who are grandparents, whatever connection you have with, with kids, is you've got to make sure that parents are talking to their children about what they're experiencing on the internet and make sure that they are comfortable in coming to you when something uncomfortable happens to them. You really do need to know what sites they're on and what they're doing. And uh, as I've talked about, in the past few years, these social networking sites like MySpace and Zanga and Facebook have become enormously popular. Teens are signing up for them by the thousands every single day. And so, as I said, when they do that, they fill out these profiles, they put stuff up about themselves that allows these predators to track them down. 
Let me follow up on Phil Hale's comment about how he's looking at, uh, at what his students are up to. And this has proved to be a very effective communication when you talk to high school students. Colleges and universities and employers are more and more getting on to these social networking sites when they're trying to come down to a determination. Is this somebody I want to hire? Is this somebody we want to admit to our school? And when they see inappropriate pictures, kids you know, drinking underage, kids doing drugs when they're underage, kids who are exposing themselves in one way or another, oftentimes the answer to those questions is, no, we won't admit that person. No, I don't want that person working uh, at our business. They're inappropriate for our environment. And so the internet and what kids are doing on the internet has a potential to have a long-term impact in their lives, and they need to understand that. So my, my key advice, as I said, talk to your kids. Um, two, don't overreact if they come to you and tell you something. You want them to be able to feel comfortable in doing that. And three, and this is probably the most important, the biggest red flag we see, kids who have uh, hours and hours of uninterrupted access to the internet in their own room or in some part of the house where there's no parent, there's no other person that ever walks by, those are the kids that are getting in trouble. And I hate to tell you this, but it's not the bad kids that are getting in trouble. A students, B students, really good kids that just end up in a very unbelievable situation that they can't imagine how it happened to them, parents can't imagine, but in fact, it is happening. So as annoying as this may seem to your kids, as annoying as it may seem to you, put the computer that has internet access in a common place in the house. If you have a wireless network in your home, you might want to rethink some of that. And you can feel free to blame me if you need to. Um, They'll forget by the time they get to vote. Um, as you can see, <laughs> they'll understand it better. Um, so as you can see, I mean, I've talked about two issues, one that maybe you were interested in but didn't show it, predatory lending, and the other that you at least showed a little more interest in, uh, the internet safety issue. Both of these are very complex but very important issues, as I said, to hundreds of people, hundreds of families throughout our state, really throughout our country. We're trying to take the lead in these areas to make sure that the people here in the state of Illinois are better protected uh, from these civil issues as well as criminal issues that are really uh, potentially very, very difficult, very, very destructive. Uh, before I close, I briefly mentioned uh, there is a whole wonderful table and a few scattered people who work in my office. They're really the people who deserve a round of applause from all of you for the hard work that they do every day. They, uh, they make the work that, uh, that we do possible. And with that, if anybody can endure a little more time with me, uh, I believe we have time for questions. Are you going to come and tell me, how do, we, how do you pronounce this properly? And want to thank you for your support. I'm going to answer the question on the first topic, which I found very interesting. Thank you. <laughs> and then so did five other people. Okay. Everyone in the room might like, hate me because no, I disagree with you on something. Let's pretend I'm somebody who's got terrible credit. I my credit cards run up all the way to the edge. I'm paying 22 percent. If I get a subprime loan, it's going to be less than the 22 percent. The problem is, though, that when I get that loan, I don't cut up my credit cards. I run them up again. So I don't, I don't feel sorry for the subprime guys. They've seen a market that, that they can take advantage of. And as long as it's legal, why shouldn't they? It's the person's fault who's run up all the credit card bills, not the lender's fault. Well, I would disagree with you because it's not the individual's fault who's run up their credit card bills if they get into a subprime loan where they've never been told what the terms are and they've been lured into it being told that it's going to be at a very low rate, they've never been told that it's an adjustable rate. That's what we see happening every single day. Uns unscrupulous, let me finish, unscrupulous lenders. There are obviously legitimate lenders out there. There are obviously people who do get into loans where they know what the terms are. And you're right, they could possibly be better terms. But oftentimes, and I'm, you know, we've been doing this for a number of years in the office, so it's nothing new. We know that there are too many unscrupulous lenders out there that are not getting the best loan for the borrower and are getting them into loans that they could never afford in the first place. These, what we're trying to do in terms of putting in place these protections will not harm scrupulous, good, decent lenders. It will 
impact and harm the unscrupulous lenders, and that's what we're trying to do here. Why do they charge you the protection of the legislation that if you have a loan at a certain rate that you have to give up your credit cards or only have one card? If you want to help the people, give them the financial education so they don't lose their credit cards again. That would be wise. I hear people from some bank complaining. All right. Go ahead, Kathy. Next. I'm Peter Scozzi. I'm board chair of CAN TV. Um, and I just wanted to ask a question about um, House Bill 1500, which actually we're working with your staff right now on some uh, amendments to that. What is your office doing to sort of protect consumer rights and consumer protections issues within uh, House Bill 1500. Well, you're, you're obviously well aware, as are the people from AT&T, of whom there's a full table here, and Comcast. I think all, yeah, Roland Burris has his Comcast crew as well. So everybody's represented in the room. We could probably negotiate the bill at the end of lunch. Um, as you are aware, we have been very adamant about making sure that we have strong consumer protections in that bill, also making sure that um, you know, the current provisions in terms of cable access are continued. And, uh, and I don't think at this point even the folks at AT&T disagree with us about doing that. Right, Bill? Yes. See? They're on board. <laughs> So uh, I can assure you that that is of, uh, one of our highest priorities, but um, at the end of the day will not be the most difficult uh, goal to accomplish. Thank you. I'm Maureen Heddington. I'm from West Suburban Ridge. First of all, I applaud all the work that you've done, your environmental voting record. It's an, it, voting, your environmental record. I understand. It's, it's, it was good when I was in the Senate, too. Yes, it was. But we probably it. didn't get to vote on a lot of bills when it was controlled by the Republicans. <laughs> concerns regarding safety as well as its opposition to the federal GNEP program, the Global Nuclear Energy Partnership, which would bring nuclear waste, including weapons usable plutonium, through our streets, highways, expressways, uh, here in Illinois. Right now, I understand the targeting sites at Argonne and at Morris, but from what I've been able to find out, Union of Concerned Scientists is who told me about it because it didn't appear in any of our papers, as it should have. Uh, but I-294, I-88, uh, I-90, and 74 are all at this point being targeted. Uh, they want to reprocess these things, the, this nuclear waste, in our communities. And right now, the Department of Energy is running roughshod over the communities and West in the western suburbs. Uh, we haven't been given the kind of notice for hearings that we should be getting. Uh, our notice, our hearing was actually in Joliet, and they didn't run it in the largest circulated paper in our community. Can you tell me the status of your inquiry into <coughs> this issue? We, as you are well aware, um, have been very concerned about this issue. One of the things that we're doing, and I would encourage you to do as well, uh, is to work with the congressional delegation, uh, particularly in terms of making sure that sufficient notice is given prior to these hearings taking place. Um, you know, this has been both an environmental concern as well as just a public safety concern. Uh, and it's not unique to the state of Illinois. So there is work that we have been doing. We know that other states are involved as well. Uh, and we will continue to do so. Have you reached out to uh, your congressman? I have not at this point, no. But I have made complaints to DOE who says we already had our hearing and we didn't know about it. So That's your own just problem. Didn't do a very good job. All right. Well, we will follow up with you. Thank you. Go, go talk to the folks at my table <laughs> before you leave. <laughs> Oh, right, right, wait. Don't talk to my folks. Go talk to Mike Daly or Ken Bennett. Well done, Lisa. Well done. Yeah, yeah. Go to the next table if I'm not kidding. Mike Alvarez is handling this for Senator We have some wonderful people from Senator Durbin and Senator Obama's office. They would be happy to help you. Harriet. Hi, I'm Harriet Ellis. Soon to be with the Illinois Criminal Justice Information Authority, and I want to compliment you on your office, uh, Attorney General. Uh, my question is a little segue from all this, but with the recent tragedy at Virginia Tech, um, is there any examination of our mental health laws? Because I was involved in a potential intervention with someone who's mentally ill was told by the police, unless the person did something, nothing could be done. And I respect the rights of everyone mentally ill, but I think we could see the danger when 
an intervention doesn't get completed before something's done? Well, one of the areas that we've very specifically been looking at, and those of you who are loyal NPR listeners, you may have heard this morning on WBEZ, Kara Smith, um, my deputy chief of staff, was spoke with them during an interview. One of the problems that we appear to have in Illinois, as do numerous other states, is that um, the information, when somebody fills out a FOID card request, what you need in order to purchase a firearm, uh, you know, they do actually ask whether or not you've ever had um, any mental condition, any mental issues. Well, if people lie about it, there doesn't currently appear we're looking into it, but making sure that that information is collected in a usable database nationwide, um, obviously, um, Senator Obama has been speaking about this in the aftermath of Virginia Tech, as have others, and uh, we will be working to make sure that that information uh, is available, is in fact used, and is in fact accurate, uh, so that we hopefully can prevent people who are unstable from getting a hold of firearms, uh, and God forbid, um, you know, massacring as many people as occurred last week at Virginia Tech. Thank you. Electric D reg? Yeah. Well, I think you know we have a we have a problem. Pat Giordano, the energy law firm Giordano and Neilan. So we have a prominent, influential group here, and I think it's important. There's been a lot of uh, press, a fair amount of press on the electric issue. And as you know, our office, on behalf of our client, Boma Chicago, has been working with years to try to lower rates, challenge the rate increase. There seems to be a stalemate now between the Senate and the House, certainly on the ComEd rate freeze. Uh, and the Ameren rate freeze did pass the Senate. I just would like to ask you, because I know you're very good at describing this, if you could describe what the fight is about so that this group understands it. Uh. Which, exactly which fight among the many in that arena are you, do you want, do you want me to describe kind of the overview of the problem here? Yes. Okay. Because <laughs> we have another 10 minutes. Um, <laughs> let me, let me put this in the context of, of our office and, and my perspective on it then. Uh, back in the year 2000 is when our office first got involved legally. Uh, with the so-called reverse auction that is now the process that is being used to set electric rates for ComEd and Ameren's captive customers. This auction, um, from our perspective, uh, simply would never work. Uh, it is not designed to guarantee the lowest rates. And in fact, our expert, who happens to be uh, chair of the economics department at the University of Chicago, uh, even testified that uh, it will not set the lowest rates. And as we're all aware, the people at the U of C, not known to be socialists. Uh, in not, not in economics, yes. That's sure. my point. <laughs> so, um, so we found you know, one of the, the, the best experts out there to look at this who determined that you know, this won't be the best way to set rates uh, that are fair for customers. So we have objected to the reverse auction, and we have done so through legal proceedings that ComEd and others are happy to run around saying, well, we failed uh, at all of our legal challenges. Well, in fact, if they would be more honest, they uh, would have to admit that the merits of our legal arguments have never been addressed and that they are currently awaiting to be addressed by the Second Circuit, or not the Second Circuit, but the Second District Appellate Court here in Illinois, which uh, just a few weeks ago called for an oral argument on our lawsuit challenging the ICC's authority to even allow um, the reverse auction to be used to set rates. Um, our contention is that based on the amendment to the Public Utilities Act in 1997, uh, there is no authorization to put in place so-called market-based rates when there is no market. So we are all, uh, if we are customers of ComEd or Ameren, we're captive customers. There's no market. Until there's a declaration of competition, which ComEd and Ameren will admit has not occurred for the vast majority of customers, certainly all residential customers, all small business customers, you clearly can't have market-based rates. I think this would be another situation where the folks at UFC would agree with me. So that's where we are at, at that point in terms of our legal challenge to the use of a reverse auction concocted by uh, ComEd and Ameren to set rates. The next 
issue that we should talk about briefly is our recent filing in front of FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Uh, they are the entity that is charged with regulating wholesale electric rates. And in the aftermath of the auction, we had numerous experts, uh, including um, Robert McCullough, who is an individual who was credited uh, back in the early 2000s of testifying in front of Congress, and because of his testimony, uh, there had to be a, a look at what had taken place with Enron. So again, I think we found one of the best experts in the country. He looked at this. Um, others from Illinois and across the country have looked at it, and they have determined uh, that the auction really didn't work in ways that we anticipated it would not work. So there seems to be evidence of price manipulation. There seems to be evidence of market manipulation. So we've asked FERC to look into that. Um, in addition, we have a couple of ongoing investigations into Ameren and their practices. Uh, to the extent that uh, any of you read downstate media, uh, so far the impact of these new electric rates has been extraordinarily uh, painful on people downstate who are Ameren customers who have um, all electric uh, in terms of you know how their heating as well as their air as well as all of their appliances work. Some people's bills have gone up, and this is not an exaggeration, 100, 200, 300 percent is the worst we've seen. Uh, but those people are suffering, and the question there in terms of our investigation is at what point did Ameren stop marketing what used to be an all-electric discount? So there are folks who were convinced by Ameren because of a discount they would provide to start to either you know, remodel a home, purchase a home that was all-electric. Uh, they knew uh, at some point in 2005 that they were going to be discontinuing this. Uh, there are many people who have told us they never were made aware of that uh, prior to their purchase or prior to remodeling. In addition, um, we also are, are looking into other aspects of, um, of what Ameren's doing in their behavior. So we are very, very involved and very engaged. The question that it sounds like you're trying to ask is what's going to ultimately happen in the legislature, and I don't have an answer to that question. Um, you know, there's certainly an ongoing battle uh, as to whether or not uh, a rate relief bill or a rate freeze bill will include ComEd. Kind of a short answer to the question. Well, Leave yeah. it on. <laughs> Let me move on. That is actually a short answer. It is. It was only five minutes. I'll be arguing with your office if you call the court. I mean, Good luck. Second and, and I, I'm hoping <laughs> no, no, yeah. not, not against our office, with our office. Yeah, He's I, on our I, side. I'm hoping maybe you'll probably hate me for this, but maybe you'll consider personally arguing that. <laughs> what could be more fun? <laughs> the close. State your name. My name is Holly Agra, and I have many seasonal employees, and I am very worried about the explosion of the numbers of payday loan facilities in the state. So are we. We don't like them at all. Um, I mentioned at some point during my conversation about uh, mortgage foreclosures, subprime lending, that we have been going out doing educational summits. When we do, we talk about predatory lending in a very expansive way, and one of the main issues we talk about are payday loans, so that people realize that they're about the worst way. Uh, you know, if you need money, I encourage people like beg from your relatives who can't stand you at this point, because you know, even if you know. There's more bad personal feeling among the family members. It's better than the rates that people are getting charged for payday loans. That, as you know, um, is a continuing battle here in Illinois. We have been unable to pass, in all honesty, effective legislation, because every time we are able to, after years and years of struggle, to pass legislation to put in place some restrictions on these payday loans, what the payday lenders do is they simply change their products so they're outside of the reach of those restrictions. So we are continuing to fight that battle, and to the extent that you all are in contact with people who may be thinking of taking out a payday loan, um, you know, steer them to a credit union, steer them to some place where they're actually a legitimate rate uh, on a loan product as opposed to these payday loans where they're just terrible. Thank you all for your patience. I appreciate it. It's like a whole tea set now. Hold on, hold on for one minute. Just let me take a minute. I mean, uh, 
We got to give Lisa her, her, she has a tea set now. Now you can, yeah. by the way, you can use a little tea. By the way, uh, some of you may know that I have spent most of my life writing about Illinois and Chicago politics, right, wrong? And that uh, I've always said the attorney general position has never been a great stepping stone. I think I'm going to be proved wrong very soon. Yeah. How about a round of applause for Lisa Mary? A mug. Another one-year membership, sooner or later, Lisa, pay up. And another history of the City Club of Chicago. How about a one more round of applause and we're adjourned?